So Stephanie, thank you so much for um, for reaching out and for also agreeing to have this on the uh, How to Be Cheeky Visual podcast. Um, I have just a few questions for you. I know that you're obviously working on a project for your entrepreneurship class um, at UVA. If you um, wouldn't mind just explaining like what the project is and maybe how you uh, kind of came to start this particular entrepreneurial project, that would be some really great context for me. Yeah, so our project, um, we've now come up with the name of Cavalier Cocktail, and it's for our entrepreneurial class. And the idea behind it is to make a UVA theme mixer. Um, and for context, the college that I go to is the University of Virginia, and everyone on my team, we're all current seniors. And basically, we want to bring a new and exciting school-spirited themed drink to the university. Awesome. So what I'd love to do then is maybe I'll just ask you a few more questions about like how you kind of uh, got to cocktail mixers in the first place. And then I know you have questions for me so we can switch over then. Um, so I guess my, my next question is, you said there's four of you, correct? Um, there, in addition to me, there's four, so five total. Okay. Five total. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And mm -hmm. is this, is the intention with this project that it's like simply a school project or are you, do you think that you guys may actually try to start this business um, after college or even now? So like the baseline is that it's a school project, but all of us, like we're all very motivated to actually um, start this as a business. And so right now we're kind of, you know, testing it, getting out on the streets, getting our proof of concept out there um, and seeing if this was something that, people really want. Got it. So what sort of um, research have you done up to this point to ascertain interest? Yeah, so we've done a ton of empathy interviews. And then we've also done a pretty big survey. Um, so we've probably done about 75 uh, in person or on the phone interviews with um, people in our uh, potential customer demographics. So whether that be current students or young alumni or parents of UVA students. And then we've also launched a survey that's gotten about 260 responses so far. And the questions that we're asking people are, you know, are they interested in this product? Um, what kind of like product specs would they like to see? What kind of flavor? Um, and then, you know, what they might purchase it for. So we're doing a lot of market research there. And we're excited to say that like a lot of the people, the majority of people that we've interviewed are very interested in it. So, you know, when we asked them on a scale of one to five, um, five was the most common response with four to five being the majority. Got it. Now, have you made any product and sampled people on the product or has it exclusively been um, data? Yeah, so right now we are actually only two weeks into like, you know, starting this project on the class. Oh, wow. so, okay. yeah, we, we, we really tried to like hit the ground running with getting all this research. Um, and so the launch date for having um, products, product samples and prototypes out there um, is gonna be March 1st. And that's when we're hoping to get them into the hands of, you know, students and people in the community. Got it. Um, and then this one, and again, I know sometimes people tend to be, well, sometimes people can be like a little bit um, cagey about this. So if you feel uncomfortable, we don't have to talk about this piece of it. But um, in terms of the types of products people said they would want to buy, was it particular cocktail, like mixers, like a margarita cocktail mixer? Was it known things like that? Or was it people were describing like, Oh, I like citrusy things, or I like, you know, spirit forward things. Like, I guess, how are you, how are you crafting your product line um, in order to then make the prototypes to test them on people? Right. So, like the core concept and idea that we started with, which we asked people like whether they would want something, is a school themed drink. So our school colors are blue and orange, and then so we we're planning to have a blue cocktail mixer and an orange cocktail mixer. Um, and then we asked them about, you know, what kind of like container, like packaging and flavoring they would want to see. Well, first we asked, you know, if the concept was something that interested them, which they said like barely yes to. And then we asked more specifics about like, you know, what, uh, what kind of flavors would you want to see? And also what we found, um, at least for the college market, is that um, a lot of people like, well, not a lot, I would say like from our survey results, about 70% of people have like tried a cocktail mixer or like a mixer with their liquor before. But of those, like 
50% don't remember the brand. And then there's another, you know, like 30% that have never tried. So basically like the way that we see it is that the school um, spirit and then the, like the, the UVA community and like the, the novelty of this is what's really gonna like get them to like try it. But then like the flavor and the taste is like what will hopefully keep them coming back and making it like a tradition around the school. Got it. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting um, value proposition, actually, because <clears throat> like broadly within the spirits and cocktail world, you do see regional success and, and regional affinity. For example, I think it's Wisconsin that it's like the, there's a very particular brandy old fashioned. So instead of using whiskey, they prepare it with brandy, they're muddling cherries, there's like a specific preparation. Um, and so there is, again, affinity at a regional level. Sometimes I personally have never seen it associated with a school, but I think it's I think it's an interesting I think it's an interesting idea. Um, do you know what you would make it out of? Like, because we've got some colors. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. would it, like, would they be natural things? Like, is there anyone on your team who has like a food or beverage background, even working in bars or restaurants, or like, how would you get to that liquid development portion of it? Right. So um, one of the members on the team used to be a bartender working in the local area. And so we have him taking the lead on, you know, uh, product formulation in terms of like the recipe. And what we found from research on the surveys is that people generally like don't really like the word um, syrup and like just like uh I guess, less healthy sounding ingredients. So they're okay with, you know, like cane sugar and like sugar, but they don't really like syrup and they would prefer like juice to anything that says like syrup or um, perhaps concentrate. Um, but we are basically in terms of the formulation trying to get like more natural sounding ingredients in there. And then also like uh, citrus was like one of the most popular flavor um, flavor like votes, I guess people, people like that one. Yeah. Got it. I guess I have one more question before we transition into your questions. So is the, um, the culmination of all of your work with the capstone project, do you need to have prototypes? Like what is the, what is the final deliverable? Just so I'm clear about like where you're actually trying to go. Yeah. So I would say that like the actual class is like the baseline for what everyone on my team, like what we're all aiming towards. Like we would like to see this um, take off as a business if we see that there's like, you know, enough demand for the product. Uh, for the actual class, we're basically graded on like our effort in like pushing the, the project forward. So there's no like specific deliverable or prototype that's required. Um, we have like uh, the, the latest deliverable is like a pivot or play. So like whether we're going to continue with the project or change, then there's like a midpoint check-in and then there's like an individual reflection on like the work that we've done and then like also like a peer thing. But it's not like a very specific, like, oh, you have to do like X, Y, and Z. Like nobody is saying that you have to have a prototype, but obviously if we want to like have a company, um, have a chance of being successful, like we do. Um, so that's where I think our team is very committed to going like above and beyond just like the great expectation. Sure. Uh, I said that was my last question, but I have another one. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you personally, what feels like success with this project or what will feel like success for you? Yeah. Um, for me personally, I think, uh, building a product that the students enjoy and like really like if we find that like the hunch and the concept that we had in the beginning um, actually is proven to be correct and people like, you know, enjoy a school spirited drink, uh, drink um, that would be one thing. And then also like, so like sales connected to that and the process. So I think um, this being like probably by the end of the semester will be like the farthest that I've gone with like a startup idea or like entrepreneurial adventure. Um, and there's already like a lot of learning that we're doing on, on the way in terms of um, getting this research, um, pivoting, even like, you know, like what we think we should do versus like what people say that they prefer and then having a change on that. So it's definitely a big um, learning experience and um, working with the team as well. So I think like the experience of the process and then ideally like uh, results that come from like our proof of concept actually working. Awesome. Okay, awesome.
Um, why don't we switch to your questions? I'm sure we have more dialogue to have afterward, but I would love to hear what you have for me. Yeah, of course. Um, so I actually first heard about, you know, like cheeky cocktails and you guys and what you're doing from a podcast um, that you had on the pitch. Um, yeah. And then this is like back when you guys were uh, swig and swallow, I think in like 2017. Um, so my first question just to like, you know, set like the groundwork is what encouraged you to start uh, swig and swallows like now cheeky cocktails? Yeah, so I've been in food, beverage, and hospitality for 25 years. I started, I'm not gonna tell you actually how old I am, but I started when I was a queen, let's just say. Um, <laughs> just kind of grew up throughout the industry. Ultimately, after working in bars, restaurants, cocktail bars, and the like, I ended up being a brand ambassador, and concurrently, I was teaching cocktail classes at uh, five different schools over six years. Um, and so in that experience, I taught thousands and thousands and thousands of consumers how to make cocktails and noticed that all of these very intelligent uh, individuals would come into these classes, want to do great by their friends and family and be proud of something they made and they would feel really insecure and feel less than like, I'm not capable of doing this. Like, you know so much and I know so little. And I was, trying for a long time to figure out how can people with minimal training feel empowered and feel capable in their own home or anywhere outside the bar. And so initially Swig and Swallow was fresh and natural cocktail mixers. We sold the, we mixed everything together except for the spirits, sold the bottles half full and you would fill the bottle up with spirits to complete the drink. So it was as foolproof as it possibly can get to complete. It was really, you know, 10 to 15 cocktails, depending on the size of the cocktail that you were drinking. Um, I had so many learnings in that period of time. And quite frankly, it didn't even just start off as starting Swig and Swallow as a consumer packaged good product. It had started off as a batching and delivery service. So spirits companies would pay me thousands of dollars to basically batch large volumes of mixers. They would provide the spirits. But again, it was like literally in half old milk jugs. Um, and then they would just add the spirits of the venue. So it evolved over time. Basically, I would say, so it's 2021 now. So I guess in 2019, the knowledge I'd accumulated over roughly four years of running the business had illuminated for me that there were a host of changes we needed to make over time that we had just deferred saying, we'll address this later when we have more money, when we have our own custom bottle, when we have blah, blah, blah. And I just realized that there's some really critical challenges that we have with the product consumer education being a huge one. And this is one I would encourage you guys to think about as well. But consumer education, like since it was really innovative, nobody had nobody sells half full containers of anything most of the time, just educating any consumer around that and also making it clear that this was a value add, not a negative. Um, those were some of the really, really big critical challenges we had to solve. Refrigeration was another really big one, which was we formerly were doing an HPP cocktail mixer, meaning the process we used to extend shelf life only got it to refrigerated to refrigeration, not to shelf stability. And what I found out, and again, hopefully this is helpful for you, but what I found out over years is that it's not just about the fact that it's more challenging to ship a refrigerated product. It is also that a refrigerated product must be refrigerated in the entire supply chain. So instead of being able to ship, ship you know, to via freight, via parcel service, whatever, shelf stable ambient product, we always had to have our product refrigerated or frozen from start to finish. We never froze with, with that product, but the point is, is it was never able to be ambient and storage and transport for refrigeration and for frozen product is exponentially higher than it is for shelf stable. But then finally in retail, um, there's basically the, the most expensive or the, the d most difficult uh, shelf space is in frozen and then in refrigerated and then it's on shelves um, in ambient um, in the ambient rest of the store. So that was the other thing, which is like cocktail mixers as a category live in the shelf stable ambient areas. They don't normally live in refrigerated and they don't normally live in frozen. And so that those were the biggest challenges that I had to confront. So besides that, as you might remember from the pitch podcast, um, one of the one of the pieces of feedback that the investors had given me was swig and swallow sounds a little weird. Like it's not like I'm going down the street to get a swig and swallow. And that was something I had been thinking about since launch 
because it was honestly, I accidentally got that name. It wasn't, there wasn't, there wasn't even a business associated with it when I decided on the name Swig and Swallow. And so I was really trying to think about what is a name that really, that it's, it's speaking about the consumer as well as the product. So somebody who identifies as cheeky can identify with this product and somebody who finds that to be inspiring or aspirational can identify with it. Um, so I think that there's like, when you look at brands like a Supreme, um, for example, people, there's like, there's like a whole ethos and a feeling that's associated with it. It's not merely the brand name. Um, and I also wanted a name and this again, from, from the pitch, I'm sure you'll remember this, but, um, they mentioned skinny girl in, in, in the pitch as an example of like a really good name with a, a lot of clear promise in the name for what the consumers would, would be getting in the, in the product. Um, and so I, in the same way that that brand name translated as skinny girl margaritas, I also wanted our name to be able to translate to like, oh, I, I feel like having a cheeky margarita right now, or I feel like having a cheeky shot with my friends, it's like lemon drop shot with my friends. And so those were the core reasons that I decided to pull this thing apart and then put it back together again. Um, and then here we are with uh, <laughs> cheeky cocktails, bar quality syrups and juices for the home bartender. Yeah, that's great. It's like, I'm feeling cheeky right now. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's actually uh, very topical that you you mentioned how you went from something that was refrigerated to shelf stable because that's what I'm like you know working with one of the members of my team on in the recipe for like getting it shelf stable. Um, so, do you have any like tips and tricks on that? Like, I think the avenue that he was thinking um, was basically like using uh, heat and then keeping it at a specific temperature and bottling it right away to like cook off the bacteria and like, yeah. So uh, if you had any more insights in terms of like how you got your uh, drink shelf stable, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, so um, so we so that's the hot fill process. That is what mm -hmm. we use and that is my assumption is like the vast, vast, vast majority of mixers and bar syrups and things of, the, of that nature are, um, do use that process. Um, I would say maybe just to illuminate a challenge with it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is more on the juice side rather than on the syrup side. Um, but there is like, if you, if you do what we decided, which was to not add additives, preservatives or artificial colors or flavorings, um, there is like heat has a very extreme effect on color. So that is, I would say, one of our bigger um, challenges right now is deciding how we want to address that as we scale, because we've been growing very quickly. And on one hand, I definitely think we can and we should lean into the marketing message around that, which is if something stays the same color in your possession and it's made of real things, it will be changing color. If it if it doesn't if it doesn't change color, then something's been added to it. And we know that consumers are looking for transparency of ingredients, higher quality of ingredients, all natural, no preservatives, all of those things. Um, but that said, I very fully understand why larger companies always add uh, add preservatives to their products. And that's something that again, I don't know if we're going to have to do that at some point. Um, it's very tempting to be like, oh, if I just added citric acid or ascorbic acid or, you know, something seemingly um, inoffensive, then, you know, the color would stay the same. So so anyway, so yes, you guys are barking up the right tree in terms of the process that you're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that you, if you are producing in-house, you need a really dedicated, I would say definitely somebody with food service experience, like substantive food service experience, ideally with manufacturing experience. There's a lot of um, education that you should be putting yourselves through um, from the food safety perspective, because this is serious stuff. People are putting this in their bodies. Um, so if you're making it in-house and even if you're co-manufacturing it, um, I would, I think that you guys should be the absolute most knowledgeable people about the processes you're using for your process, because nobody else is gonna care as much as you do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would love to follow up if you have like additional resources that you guys use for that. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and then uh, in terms of like you guys saying that you're you're scaling very quickly, um, what would you say was like most attributive to that growth? Like, do you have any advertising and brand strategies that you found to be effective, or if it's any other reason, love to hear it. Um, I, I mean, I think I think the most obvious thing is that we launched into the beginning of coronavirus, so um, the the world, like in, and we've talked about this on the How to Be Cheeky podcast before, but uh, in moments of disruption, in moments of behavior change, it is kind of a gold mine for those who are willing to lean into it. And so I think that's the most obvious thing is, I was planning on very casually, like no pressure launching this at the end of April. Then in March, when we saw everything happening with coronavirus, I decided to actually launch sooner change the format of the bottles. We were going to launch with a larger larger bottle, it was a 375 milliliter bottle. Decided because again, social distancing, people are not going to be like in groups, decided to launch what we have now, which is a four ounce bottle. So I'd say that's the most obvious one is all of a sudden everyone became a home bartender, all of a sudden everyone mm -hmm. was home. And so thereby attention was being placed in this particular, um, in this particular category within, again, within um, consumer packaged goods. So that's thing one. I think thing two is, you know, I, I do have um, at this point, you know, almost like 25 years of experience in the food and beverage industry and the depth of those connections, the majority of our big clients that have converted are people that I know or somebody I know that know somebody else, um, people who've come via referral. So B2B is very, very big for us um, between mm -hmm. wholesale and um, our drop ship bulk, uh, bulk orders shipping across the country. So I think that it's just like providing the right product at the right time with the requisite network. Um, and quite frankly, again, with four years of experience of, of how these things work, we were really uniquely positioned to scale quickly. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, for sure. I mean, like I'm, I'm one of those people that definitely got into, um, you know, mixology over quarantine. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, yeah have you noticed that um, there are any specific drinks that like you need to succeed or flavors that are most popular? Um, or like, have you had any uh, feedback mm -hmm. in terms of the flavors that uh, you guys have or what people like? Yeah, it tends to well, so, okay, from a flavor perspective, and this held true for Swig and Swallow as well, because we had a Moscow Mule slash Kentucky Mule, but from a flavor perspective, people love ginger, people love mint. Like, those are flavors that just pop if they taste right. Um, I would say, though, and the the way that we had initially come up with the um, product line for Swig and Swallow, which has then translated somewhat into what we have for Cheeky, the way that I'd come up with the original um, options for Swig was I did a Google um, Google trend search in Google AdWords search of um, the most popular, the most Googled cocktails in the country. And um, our products are made for, well, cocktails with citrus. These are cocktails like a margarita, a daiquiri, a mojito, things of that nature. Um, and so of the top 10, or actually of, of maybe of the top 12 most Googled cocktails in the United States, I think it was like, seven of them or six of them could be made with our swig and swallow product. So it was kind of easy getting to that point. And then what we have now, really, this is like our, our product line is almost exactly the reproduction of the core juices and syrups that bartenders have behind a craft cocktail bar. And this is like almost down to the, um, almost down to the exact formulation. So one of the things that I noticed was a challenge with Swig was when you have done all of the work, it means that you completely rule out any bartenders <laughs> who would ever want to use your stuff, even if they just want to support you, because they have to, like, they want to be saying, I made this by myself, or I use this in my own mixology. So mm -hmm. from my perspective, the way we display it on our site, if you've looked at our, at our website, mm -hmm. we say margarita, Moscow Mule, Cosmopolitan, identifiable cocktail names, because these are some of the most iconic, um, omnipresent cocktails across the world that are known the world over. However, the 
products that we make that support the production of these or the 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 um the person in the home making these mm-hmm. these are really so simple it's 100 lime juice 100 lemon juice you know it's really easy so i guess my point is it's not necessarily about flavor it's kind of more about like how people think about using it if that makes sense right yes definitely yeah. does yeah um yeah and then i guess also given that um you know cavalier cocktail like we just started we're definitely trying to like get like boots off the ground bootstrapping a lot of it um like in the beginning how did you really get started like how did you distribute your drinks or are there any like distribution channels and like packaging um and like labeling companies that like you recommend or just like how did you get started with all of that um with swig or with cheeky because the answers are kind of different Mm. um i would say whichever one you think would be most helpful for somebody that like you know that is starting out sure um all right well because there's what i did and then there's what i'd recommend (laughs) what you recommend what you recommend i would say i mean you can share what you did and then if there's a lesson to be learned there yeah (laughs) um okay so so what i would recommend the first thing that i'd recommend that i didn't do is um is really consider how much money can i put into this thing before i don't want to do it anymore or how much how much revenue do we have to pull in in a year for me to feel like this is a success so similar to the question i'd asked you earlier about like what what defines success for you about you know this this um um, capstone in general Mm -hmm. so that's a big question because then it leads you to your margins and for example um you you'll need to figure out like what your gross profit margin is you're going to need to figure out what other expenses are required to launch and then maintain the business um most companies are not profitable for years right so like two three years is is fast for this industry um and again food manufacturing while it's not expensive to do a small amount it's like if i do if i produce a thousand bottles or a hundred bottles or 10,000 bottles, am I just losing money the whole time or do I actually get any money from it? So I really would think, even if it's just really sketching out scenarios, I would do a lot, if I were to do this again, I would do that stuff first. (laughs) Like if it costs me a dollar to make this product or $5 to make this product, what do I have to charge to make any money on it? And then again, what are other fees that go into supporting the business? inclusive of yeah distributor fees or you know what's the markup in retail who might even want to buy the product in terms of like am i selling direct to consumer am i selling to you know other retailers am i selling to marketplaces online because other you know, people got to make money in there somewhere so um so i would say that i got started one of the great blessings of launching swig and swallow and then being in the same location that we're in right now um, in the same building in brooklyn is we launched into a food incubator. And so amongst, or we were basically amongst maybe a hundred other businesses, maybe maybe fewer, but we were surrounded by this really supportive group of people who were all pursuing a comparable dream. I think from the start, had I, had I been more open to just asking a lot of questions and sharing resources from day one, like really, not aggressively, but like actively, that would have expedited a lot of a lot of um, a lot of our process and our progress. Um, so I would say there's a lot of Facebook groups you can get involved with where it's just like CPG people or food and beverage people. Basically, I would look for as many online communities as you can find where you can learn from other entrepreneurs who may be a little bit ahead of you or maybe very far ahead of you. Um, so that's kind of like the biggest recommendation that I'd have. And I think doing what you're already doing, which is like reaching out to people like myself. Um, you know, most of us in food and beverage do want to help each other because, you know, if we can all make it like a little bit less miserable like, <laughs> uh, along the way for everybody else, we would like to. I, if it's going to be, um, but, um, but yeah, so there's a lot of people who are really excited and willing to help. 
Yes. I'm going to start rambling there. I feel like that was a lot. <laughs> You're going to start what? So I'm going to stop rambling because I feel like that was oh. a lot. <laughs> no, it was all very helpful information. I oh. think like um, I've definitely like thought about um, like the margins because I know that like if we ever were to like go into retail, which I think we're probably going to do like, you know, in person and online first, but like that retail, like they need like a pretty big margin for that. Um, and then like you said, like, you know, there's like also minimum order quantities. So it's hard to like justify doing like a giant order if you don't know that the demand is there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if so, one of the things that's interesting is like one of the one of the great benefits of doing direct to consumer mm -hmm. is, um, you know, obviously much higher margin. You get to control your brand. You get to control like the inventory and what happens with that. Um, one of the challenges is that people tend to not just buy online um, unless they've tasted it already. Mm. Now, same thing, particularly with F&B. I think there's a lot of other categories of CPG where people are really comfortable just being like, oh, I'm going to try that lip gloss or I'm going to try that whatever. But mm -hmm. I think with, probably with perfume, I would imagine, like there's people are not just going to buy it based on what the brand looks like. Mm -hmm. um, I think because of what you guys are doing, you probably have like a distinct advantage, at least when like, you know, social distancing is less of a less of a thing because if you can and I by the way I would recommend this if you can build up your base in a very concentrated local way I mean it just makes sense that it all revolves around the university and who mm -hmm. knows what you could do and this could be very interesting but let's just say let's just say you do this for a few years you're successful at it you could also basically do the same thing for universities all around, across the country you know, basically yeah. bring their like school colors to life in their unique cocktail. Yes. Mm -hmm. One thing, and I know this is like unsolicited advice, but one thing I mm -hmm. definitely would be asking around is, and you know, obviously people tasting it is going to be, is going to be part of this as well. But w one thing I would be concerned about is like cocktail fatigue. Most people don't go out and drink the same exact thing every night of the week. So mm -hmm. I would be, that's something I'd be questioning, worried about pondering. Um, mm -hmm. Because if, sure, maybe this person loves it, but maybe they only love it at like the final game of the, I was just gonna say like tournament. I'm like, I don't even know language about sports anymore. <laughs> <laughs> For basketball, like, like the March Madness tournament yeah. and all that, yeah. I don't know, but like maybe, I mean, <laughs> be something where it is their tradition every single year like the kentucky derby but mm -hmm. that's a problem if it's one event for the year so if that's the case and if you do notice that as a trend maybe maybe you've got to flesh out the product line in other ways as well so it's not just a seasonal or isolated sort of like business opportunity yeah and along those lines um like how would you encourage finding repeat customers like versus like the one and done, like you mentioned, like trying to prevent cocktail fatigue, but then also um, just getting people like, you know, interested enough to like buy every like month or so or something like that. Well, you can't force a consumer to do something. I, I mean, I think that I think that just being aware that like, it's about meeting the need of the consumer, not about like, changing their behavior. I think that distinction is very important. Um, what I would say, and this is something that's very well known within the spirits industry, is if you can create a ritual around a cocktail so for the Moscow Mule, having it in that, you know, that um, that copper mug, mug. Mm -hmm. mint julep in, you know, in a silver julep cup. Um, there's a number of other rituals that um, different spirits companies have created or supported with a lot of their marketing dollars. Um, so if you look at like the Aperol spritz, sure, it's like mm -hmm. a cocktail, but has Aperol been pumping millions of dollars into marketing around that, which is wine glass, Aperol, you know, like it's simple, the presentation is obvious. So I would say if you could create, for example, so if you can create like a ritual, and again, I'm not sure from the university perspective, how happy they'd be about this, but if you could create like a shot ritual where it's like, I pregame with my friends every Friday, with a shot, even though the size is smaller, meaning you're selling less, mm -hmm. if it's a weekly thing rather than like a, you know, a once quarterly or, I mean, not like they're yeah. thinking, but like a once a year yeah. or once a season thing, that 
I think is probably what you'd be looking for. But that being said, again, I don't know how large the like alumni group is who might be interested in sort of like supporting a school themed beverage. I think it really would be the university population itself. And you've got to consider like, how does that person or what's the life cycle of that customer or consumer? Like, are they going to then take this with them when they're 25 or when they're 30 or, you know, like does mm -hmm. it, Something you're still shooting when you're like 50 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So based on like our preliminary research, like we wanted to get more data from like younger alumni, like, you know, like 21 to 30. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem as popular with like parents, but within like the current student base and then in 21 to 30, there seems to be interest. Um, but we like would like more data for like the um, younger alumni to really like flesh that out. But yeah, it is a great question to consider. Um, one thing is like whether we make it like a little bit fancier, like in a glass bottle, like that would probably encourage like the alumni to do it versus like just for it to just be plastic and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, this is just like out of curiosity, but I remember you mentioned um, in the podcast um, back when you were going to swallow that you guys uh, launched via Kickstarter. Um, so how did that go? Like we considered it. Are there any like pros and cons or like um, anything you'd recommend from that? Oh God. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was a great way to get exposure out about us. Um, I would say we knew nothing about photography, content creation. We didn't have any money to have anyone support us in that way. So we did everything in house and the quality from my perspective was just like, I mean, even a month or two later, I'd look back on it and be like, Oh God, you know, and that stuff <laughs> forever right it's like it's on the internet forever as you know so so that's one thing is like if you if you know anybody who is good at that stuff that's one thing that i would really consider is like making like getting that as clean as as you possibly can and getting your communication as clean as, as you possibly can as like in advance um i would say that it was very successful for us in in that we we exceeded our our sorry we over double doubled our uh, the amount of money we were seeking in about 24 hours, which again, we only asked for a small amount of money, but that was on the advice of, of the Kickstarter food and beverage person. She basically was like, what I recommend is because if you, if you're like a dollar short on meeting your goal, you don't get any of it. She's like, so I always recommend you ask for the absolute minimum amount you need to get going. So we had asked for whatever, $5,000. We got in like Eleven or twelve thousand dollars again within a day, which was mm -hmm. awesome. Um, it got us what we needed. It got us our first big juicer. Got us some time in the commercial kitchen. Awesome. I would say the other really big learning from this, though, was uh, when we shipped. I think it was was it five hundred? I forget how many orders it was, but I think let's just say it was like five hundred. Um, we had never shipped product before, and the boxes were not even though we even though we did it on time the boxes were not strong enough to sustain being in transit for the whole time we were not staffed up for it like we didn't understand what to expect we didn't know how long it was going to take it was way more stressful than it needed to be um so i would say really like planning out the logistics and let's just say you are shipping a product for your kickstarter again ho hopefully you won't but if you were um I would make sure that you have already trialed shipping boxes across the country, that you know how the various carriers work together or which ones you'd prefer to work with. Um, basically, again, we did everything as soon as possible and got it out as quick as possible. Um, and I would have, had we had more time, I, it would have just gone more smoothly. But the one other, one other thing that I wanna add to that um, is that the way that we generated that much uh, exposure to it in such a short period of time was prior to launching the Kickstarter, maybe like a week or two beforehand, I had reached out to a number of people, a lot, number of my friends in the industry who had really large networks and said, hey, we're going to be posting this out at noon on this day. Would you be willing to share with your, um, with your network? And everybody said yes. And so I said, this is like, this is what we're thinking, like, feel free to customize this as, as however you'd like to. But these are kind of like the 
points we'd like to hit. And then I followed up, I think like an hour before we posted and just said, hey, we're posting this out in a few. Um, and then I shared it out with them. And that was, again, basically all of that hit, you know, the very um, tight, tightly knit cocktail community all at the same time. And that was, you know, that was how we, how we did it so fast. In terms of like when people pledge, um, did you have to factor that you were gonna like be covering the shipping costs um, when you like listed how much or did you, is that like um, in addition to like what they pledged, if that makes sense? Um, I, I think that we had to, I think that we had to work it in Honestly, it was so long ago. I remember that being one of the warning warnings mm -hmm. that Kickstarter had given us. That was like, don't forget uh -huh. shipping. So I right. think that what we had done, um, and it still boggles my mind that um, the various carriers don't have a better methodology for this. But I had mm -hmm. called UPS and USPS, and they were like, we don't have an average that you can give. So what you have to do is you have to just make trial orders from your facility to, let's say, 10 different states like random addresses in 10 different states and then you've got to make the average by yourself. So that oh, was wow. how we got to that average is we're like, we know roughly the size of, you know, what this product will be, the weight, and we have a rough idea. Um, and then I think we maybe added like a very small percentage on top of that. So we didn't like eat too much of the shipping. But yeah, you have to figure right. it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you think there was like much of an advantage um, from starting on Kickstarter versus like if you you know like had a website up and then you directed like your industry connections to be like hey like we've got this? Um, um well, I mean, it's basically like so they basically it's basically giving you cash flow up front, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that the advantage is we needed $10,000 or we, we wanted $10,000. We, we, we needed mm -hmm. five, mm -hmm. but we got all of that up front and we didn't actually have to deliver it for a number of months. So that's okay. the, that's mm -hmm. the difference there, I think with that particular mm -hmm. scenario. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you're just directing people to a website, you really have no idea. There's also no like, in, there's like no catalyst to force people to support you. If that makes sense. Like people mm -hmm. feel, about supporting a, a, a small launching business. And mm -hmm. there's also the constraint of it being a month or again, you can set the timeline, but typically it's a month from what I understand that your Kickstarter is open. So mm -hmm. I think that that's the advantage. It's also, again, it's a great marketing tool. Like it allowed us to, again, get the message out very clearly, very quickly. Um, but again, there's a lot of disadvantages too. So it's really, I think you really have to evaluate it. I had said shortly after we did it, I'm never doing another one of these if we have a physical product. That uh -huh. being said, if if I had a physical product and I had a little bit of money and time, and again, we now have like, you know, there's nine other people beside myself working on Cheeky. Mm -hmm. With that, we could totally do it and it wouldn't be an issue at all, but completely being inexperienced, having no money at all, <laughs> no resources, no content, people no none of that stuff. It was really hard. So you really just have to, I think, ask a lot of people and then figure it out for yourself if it's worth it. Got it. Awesome. Um, and then I guess my last question for you is um, where do you see the market growing? Like, do you feel like there is still room and then just what's your take on like the general, you know, cocktail mix industry? Um, I have a couple of sort of conflicting thoughts on this. The mm -hmm. first, which is, um, and I actually interviewed this gentleman named um, Eugene Kubensky from, he's the he leads mergers and acquisitions for Diageo in uh, North America. <clears throat> he had mentioned how their investment strategy in different spirits companies, it's spirits, it's not a winner take all market. It's not like, it's not like people only drink one spirit to the exclusion of others. So I think mixers are very similar to that, meaning like just because you love one, it doesn't mean that you'll never drink anything else again. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of little brands there. Um, I also think, and this is again, this is the, this is the idea upon which Cheeky is founded is I believe if somebody can unlock great cocktail making for the average mass consumer, I think that that is the biggest opportunity in the mixer space. Um, what's interesting is again, from like Fever Tree, I think does this with premium 
mixers, meaning it's just like seltzer water or tonic water, or high quality ingredients, lovely branding. They're doing a great job. But when we're talking about mixers, like your and my mixers, like the juice and the syrups and, and things, mm -hmm. um, I think, honestly, I think that we are working on the idea that has the most like, or that has the greatest likelihood of becoming really, really, really big. And the reason I say that is because batch cocktails, like batch cocktails are like, if the consumer could figure out how to make a batch of margaritas or a batch of Cosmos or um, daiquiris or whatever in a few seconds, like that is what our product enables. It's mix and match. You choose your spirit, you choose your citrus, you choose your sweet. I think that that being like, oh, here's a small format version. And then here's a here's a version where if you wanna make 15, 20 cocktails for your friends at home, it's literally the same thing. Just choose one of each. Um, I think that something of that simplicity has the most potential. But then again, I mean, people could be creating hundred million dollar, you know, billion dollar companies on like a, again, Skinny Girl was not nearly that successful, but you could create, like if somebody could create a really resonant brand that also has the functionality or the perceived functionality of being like low cal better for you, there's tremendous opportunity. So I guess that's, that's my sort of conflicting answer is like, I think that there's a ton of opportunity for little companies. I do think that there's a couple of bigger opportunities that if people get them right, somebody's going to win in a really big way. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's almost like bringing the convenience of like just buying like a 12 pack of beer, but like instead like cocktails. So it's like um, to the consumer's home instead of having to like, you know, pay like 15 bucks at a bar for one. Exactly. Exactly. Which quite frankly, I've been very surprised that people continue to do, to do that during the pandemic <laughs> is like to go cocktails. But again, it's like, there's other things that are, wrapped in which is we you know we crave connection and we crave being out and we crave like being like oh i had a cocktail from such and such bar um but yeah the price differentiation from my perspective i was i found that to be a little or i still find that to be a little bit surprising that people are still willing to pay but but yeah, yeah mm -hmm. the simplicity is is where it's at mm -hmm. yes thank you so much for you know answering all of our questions this has been super helpful um you're very knowledgeable about the industry and I'm sure that we'll take all of your advice into account going forward as we're just like a little brand new startup project. Totally, totally. No, I'm so excited. If you if you want to stay in touch, I'd love to, again, hear how it goes and and hear what findings that you have. But um, yeah, if you guys have any other questions, would be super happy to answer um, and would love to also share the pod out, obviously, when when it's ready. Yes, I would love to stay in touch. Um, I will like follow up with an email and then if there's like, you know, any um, additional information in terms of like the recipe process or anything that you can think of, um, feel free to just like, you know, just send it over anytime. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Yep. Thanks, April. And thanks, Great. G. <laughs>